um, welcome everyone uh, to the first webinar of 2022 uh, for the UK Quantum Fluids Network. Um, my name is David Proman, and I will be uh, chairing this webinar today. Uh, so first of all, Happy New Year, uh, everyone. And uh, um, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, today, uh, Carlo Hewerts um, from Heidelberg University and also the uh, MEGSI uh, Institute um, that is going to give a talk on vortex motion, quantify strong dissipation in holographic superfluid. Uh, and I also want to say that there's, there was a last minute change in the, in the speaker, as you might have noticed uh, by reading the abstract, but maybe Carlo is going to say something uh, more about that. Uh, so Carlo, the audience is all yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, Davide. So it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, talk in this seminar. Uh, usually the, the community is working on holography and uh, uh, condensed matter physics, uh, uh, or all the, uh, in other fields, the experts, there is a, a considerable gap uh, between uh, holography and those communities. And uh, it, it, uh, it's great that um, we can uh, Maybe with sem this seminar, uh, uh, help a bit to to bridge this gap, and uh, uh, I hope uh, you find this interesting. What we find here, um, uh, so yeah, uh, Paul Gutmann, my my uh, former PhD student, was supposed to give this talk, but then suddenly it turned out he mm, un unforeseen circumstances uh, forced him um, to cancel, and and I took over. Uh, I hope that's not much worse, at least. Um, good, so uh, let me uh, uh, start here. Um, and uh, I assume that uh, most of you are experts in uh, quantum fluids, but not so much in holography. So I, uh, I think it, um, it's worthwhile well to, to explain what holography is. Now, uh, this is a huge field and I'll try to give a the basics, uh, so yeah, you at least get an idea of what, what this is about. Now, uh, I, uh, in preparing that talk, of course, um, I tried to get the information and I uh, 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 Google, uh, that is uh, to say, I did some uh, intense research on uh, holograms. Um, and here's what you find uh, if you do that, you find plexiglass uh, uh, pyramids on mobile phones. Uh, you can uh, do a self-assembly and then usually you put a video on your mobile phone and what you see is in most cases for some reason it's jellyfish um, swimming uh, inside this uh, pyramid and uh, it says that's holography. Now I did some uh, further intense research. Um, it turns out uh, I found uh, the connection to holography uh, doesn't exist. So it has nothing to do with holography, what you find there. Uh, it's called Pepper's Ghost, and it's a, a century-old uh, uh, stage trick, actually. When uh, you uh, take a reflection of something, uh, for example, someone down here on a glass or some transparent screen, and then the audience over here puts that into the context. I mean, it's, a, it's a trick of your brain, an illusion effect caused by your brain that this reflection, which is transparent, uh, is put into context in uh, within the three-dimensional picture and you have a three-dimensional impression. And as you saw, it works quite well, but it has nothing to do with real holography. Actually, holography is something different. You see here, Mr. Gabor uh, up here who uh, um, invented it in uh, 1947 as a microscopic uh, uh, method. Um, um, down here you see his first some of his per, first pictures, but uh, he didn't have uh, uh, really access to actual coherent light. That was very limited. And only when the laser was discovered later on, he got the Nobel Prize because then his method was really used. So what happens here is you have actually con information about um, the whole object here. This is uh, Emilio, or mascot of our Emmy Institute. Um, and uh, what happens is that you split a laser beam, coherent light, via a mirror on a holographic, uh, or some photographic uh, film. And uh, the other part of the laser beam is 
uh, directed onto the object and from there onto the uh, uh, screen or, or onto the holographic plate. And now the distance here between the object and, uh, and, and uh, the, the photographic plate uh, contains the phase information because well, the distance corresponds to the phase here and the interference with this reference beam then uh, ensures that you have in this two-dimensional picture, the full three-dimensional distance information. Um, and it's really stored there, not just like an illusion. Now that is holography, and I hope you'll uh, understand why what I'm going to explain now is also called holography. So uh, here is a, a hologram of Mr. Gabor. We are moving in front of this, uh, this uh, two-dimensional picture. And I'll play it once more. And please have a look in particular at this pen holder here. And you will see that really you get a three dimensional impression. And it's real. Uh, when you see it here, actually, you see all angles and everything um, uh, uh, is contained in this two dimensional picture. Now, uh, what you need to know to understand the type of holography we are doing is uh, just a few things from uh, physics. You need to know there are fundamental interactions like gauge series, like for example, uh, quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics, um, and uh, they have a coupling constant, which can be depending on the circumstances or on the theory, large or small. In QCD, for example, you have a region where it's, where it's large, difficult to describe, you need non perturbative methods. We have only a very limited number of them. And uh, you could also have small coupling, but in general, large and small coupling are possible, and um, large coupling is difficult. Then you need to know gravity. Well, in the somewhat older or in the more recent formulation. Um, and you need to know string theory. Now, uh, all you need to know about string theory is here. There are open and closed strings, exactly what you imagine. Left is open, right is closed. You guessed that. Um, if you want to quantize this, you need 10 space-time dimensions. It doesn't work otherwise. And automatically, in these string series, you have non-perturbative objects, among them D-brains, Dirichlet brains, uh, extended objects uh, 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 with a large mass, uh, and open strings can end on, the, on them, and the boundary condition lead to the name Dirichlet brains. And, and this is uh, of utmost irrelevance to uh, all what we are doing here. String theory is known as a candidate for uh, theory of quantum gravity and unified theory. That's completely irrelevant for uh, the applications we are using. We are using it just as a mathematical tool to derive it. Well, other people have derived it and we are using it. Um, now, um, this holography or also called gauge gravity duality is about a special duality. What is a duality? Now you can have a physical system, which is described by two different theories. If both theories describe the same system, they have to be in some sense equivalent, or there has to be some relation. And that is called a duality. Simple example is quantum mechanics, where you have a, a momentum space and a position space description. Degrees of freedom are different, but of course, you know, a very uh, simple transformation between them. But in general, you can have two theories which are related uh, in, in a more complicated way. And it turns out actually the degrees of freedom in such dualities can be very different in the two series. And uh, that brings me to this famous ADS CFT correspondence, which uh, Juan Maldacena in, uh, discovered in 97 using string theory. It's a duality of this kind, two series describing the same system. One is an anti desitter space, gravity, and the other is a conformal field theory, in that case, a gauge theory and they have even different dimensions. So one is a quantum field theory without gravity in three plus one dimensions, it happens to be a conformal field theory in the original case. And it's dual in that sense, equivalent to a gravity theory in four plus one dimensions on an anti space. That is not strictly proven, but you can test it in many circumstances, it always works. And as I said, it's independent of whether string theory is a fundamental theory of nature. Um, now you might ask, uh, how does it work uh, that uh, the number of the, the dimensions can even be different? How can you store in different dimensions the same information content? 
And that's fundamental uh, uh, property of quantum gravity uh, called the holographic principle. In a theory of quantum gravity, you have to have the property that the uh, dynamics in the volume can be equivalently described to degree supreme only on the surface of that volume. The best example well known is black holes where the surface area encodes the full information that this entropy of the black hole is proportional to the surface. And that is a general property of quantum gravity. So it's kind of natural that this can happen from this point of view at least. Now, another important property in the sense of strong and weak coupling that I mentioned is that this duality, this special duality, does not only relate the series in different dimensions, but uh, when one of the series is strongly coupled, the other is weakly coupled, which means it's useful because we can describe or map via this duality simple problems in weakly coupled gravity, classical gravity basically, to strongly coupled gauge theory, something which is really, really difficult to describe otherwise. And that's the main value of this, this whole duality and its applications. Now, you would have guessed this is, uh, there are more technical details and just let me flash uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, more complicated things here. So the full conjecture is actually that n equals four maximally supersymmetric young mill theory in three plus one dimensions, or gauge theory, is equivalent to full type 2b string theory on a particular 10 dimensional space consisting of an uh, anti desitter space and a sphere. This is a full conjecture, not proven, but uh, also not very useful in that sense. However, if you take the right limits and simplify it, the gauge theory can, you can take the large NC limit and the, the Toft coupling uh, large, then you have a large NC uh, gauge theory at strong coupling. On the other hand, at the same time, you can take the low energy limit of the string theory, then it becomes classical gravity, and those are still equivalent to each other or dual to each other. And that is a useful case. The full thing is not really useful for applications, but this uh, in these limits, it becomes uh, useful. And actually, classical gravity describes a quantized gauge theory. Large n, that kind of makes it a bit classical, but still it's a quantized gauge theory. Now, here's the origin of the duality, I'm not going into much details, but the system that these two theories describe is a system of D brains that I mentioned. You can have two descriptions of these D brains in terms of open strings, where the strings end on these D brains and connect them at low energies. Uh, that corresponds to the strings become basically gauge bosons if you cannot resolve them, uh, the extent, extension of the strings. On the other hand, you can describe it by, oh, by closed strings, and then the D brains cause gravitation described by closed strings. Gravitons are closed strings. They deform uh, uh, the space around them, and then you get an anti desitter space as a solution of the equations. And these are open strings and closed strings, two different possibilities. Actually, they are, again, dual to each other, um, to describe the same system of brains. And then you get two series, um, which are dual to each other from these two perspectives of describing the same set of D brains. Now, what is anti desitter space? How do we get temperature in black holes? Now, uh, um, anti desitter space is a space time, in that case, uh, four plus one dimensions with constant negative curvature. So it's kind of a settled geometry everywhere. Uh, it's a solution of Einstein equations uh, with negative cosmological constant. So here is the simplest case uh, Ricci tensor, um, uh, Ricci scalar, sorry and uh, cosmological constant, which is negative. And uh, uh, the solution is just a metric that describes the space of negative curvature. Um, now, here's the metric of such an anti desitter space. So it has one additional coordinate. As I said, it's uh, not three plus one, but four plus one dimensions, one space di uh, dimension more. And we denote this dimension by Z. And you see, if you take Z constant, then what you have here is a normal Minkowski space for every value of this additional coordinate. But the metric is scaled by a factor that depends on the coordinate. So you have rescaling depending on the size where you are in this additional coordinate. 
And uh, so this is indicated here so that the, the distances depend on uh, the point where you are in this additional holographic direction. And we speak of z equals zero as the boundary of this anti zeta space and all the rest is called the bulk. Um, now, um, due to the distance that you resolve at diff different uh, values of this holographic coordinate, you can interpret this co coordinate as something as an inverse energy scale. So one is the UV and the other is the infrared. And actually you, the boundary is in the UV and if you go down in the space, you come to the infrared region. Um, now, most important for any application of this duality, you need translation between the two series. And that's what uh, Gapsa, Klebanov, and Polyakov and Witten uh, did. They found a so-called dictionary, which translates quantities in one series to quantities in the other. It's a huge uh, dictionary by now. Um, but uh, for example, observables in the boundary series, in the gauge series, can be obtained in some cases as boundary values of fields and expectation values in the anti zeta space. And we will see an example in our holographic supercomputer. So in the sense, you can say that uh, the gauge theory lives on the boundary of the ADS space. It's kind of uh, a picture you might have in mind, sometimes misleading, but that's how it works. Now, finite temperature is, of course, something you want to describe. Many systems in, in real world, uh, strong coupling, quark one plasma superfluids have a temperature. And it turns out this is very interesting and very um, simple, actually, uh, here. Um, when you do this at finite temperature, you have the same ADS space, but with a black hole in it. Or more precisely, a black brain, because it's extended in all spatial dimensions and at some point in the additional holographic coordinate. And so the physics of the thermal system is completely encoded in the physics of a black hole in, high, in a higher dimension in this duality. And the temperature of the field theory is exactly the Hawking temperature of that black hole. Uh, here you see again the metric that we discussed uh, for, for this anti zeta space. Now you can find this as a solution uh, for black hole, you see here is a coefficient in the dt uh, squared, and uh, it has a zero exactly at a horizon position, and the horizon position corresponds to the temperature of the black hole. It's in the infrared that is down here uh, somewhere in the bulk at a position zh. So that is basically the space time we want to consider. We'll do some refinements to it, but uh, that is the basic idea. A thermal system corresponds to anti zeta space with a black hole in it um, uh, at some position down here somewhere in the bulk. And the, the position determines the temperature of the field theory that lives here uh, on the boundary. Um, now, this original ADS CFD duality has been extended in uh, many ways. And then it's called gauge gravity duality or holography. Uh, you can do all, kind, all kinds of things. You can extend it. Well, then it's even less proven uh, strictly, but uh, you can extend it in many ways. Um, you can do non-conformal theories. You can uh, introduce anisotropy, which we will do is uh, use here is a chemical potential that can be introduced by making this black hole charged in the bulk. Um, you can make it non-relativistic. You can use other number of dimensions. So we will describe a two-dimensional superfluid by a three-dimensional anti zeta space. And uh, well, you can apply it to all kinds of things. But there's one fundamental problem I'll come to in a second, um, which you try, people try to avoid by starting from this 10-dimensional setup of the original duality and introducing compactifications, additional D-brains, and so on. Then you know exactly what happens on the gauge theory side. But that is very restrictive. You have optimal control, but there are little possibilities to really uh, see what's happening. Uh, in bottom-up approaches, situation is much better. You can approach uh, all kinds of problems in, in, in physics with it, um, but you have less control 
of the duality. So for example, you can add a scalar field here in the bulk theory. In addition to the black hole, you have uh, and space time, you have also a scalar field with maybe with a potential. And you can see that defines via this dictionary uh, uh, a theory on the boundary, a dual theory. And then you have to find out what the properties are, but you don't know, know them a priori. And uh, so that is uh, uh, on the one side a problem. On the other side, it is not so bad because you can use this as model theories for strongly coupled phenomena. Uh, you have little possibility to do, describe strongly coupled uh, theories in general. So this is an exploration tool. You can use it to look at strongly coupled phenomena uh, in the first place and see whether you discover new phenomena. Actually, some uh, new effects have been discovered, which could have been discovered uh, just in field theory, but nobody thought of it. And just in this context, they were found for the first time. Um, it is particularly successful in the application to collect collective phenomena, like where microscopic theory is maybe not that, that essential. Hydrodynamics, for example, is, a, is an, uh, something where sometimes the microscopic interaction is not relevant. You can learn a lot about strongly coupled theories, uh, uh, hydrodynamics of strongly coupled theories. Um, and there are other areas where you can apply it. Um, um, you can look for universal behavior in large classes of holographic theories and then hope that these are general properties of strongly coupled theories. And um, that works, is the observation. For example, the viscosity uh, of the quark gluon plasma, or actually eta over s, uh, specific viscosity, viscosity, shear viscosity over entropy, has been measured in the quark non plasma in heavy ion collisions and by a particular uh, elliptic flow of, of uh, what happens there. And uh, you can also measure it in cold quantum gases uh, by the expansion of, a, of an elliptically uh, trapped uh, uh, gas. Turns out both theories have very similar values of eta over s, and they are really small compared to all other um, substances that are known and very close to what is actually the expectation from this holographic uh, calculation, uh, which is uh, eta over s, 1 over 4 pi. And this is very close uh, in these two. I mean, the hottest and the coldest matter in the universe have a very, at strong coupling, have a very similar viscosity um, to entropy to ratio. And that is so you can hope that this holographic approach might give you some general information on universal properties of strongly coupled uh, theories. Now, there is a key problem in this. Um, when you do these bottom-up approaches, you can introduce uh, phenomena like superfluidity and, and, and others, uh, as I will show. Um, problem is, you don't know, you do this on the gravity side with this ADS space, with a black hole, you introduce fields in the bulk and so on. But a priori, you don't know what's the field content, what's the Lagrangian, or what's the parameters of this dual theory are. It sounds very strange <laughs> that you do a construction, but it is the nature of this strong weak uh, uh, um, duality. You do something in the weakly coupled sector, but the strongly coupled sector, it's not even clear that you know what the degrees of freedom are um, a priori. And here that's very explicit that you often don't know what you describe. You know that you build in some symmetries, uh, symmetry breaking and so on. So you know, you describe, for example, the superfluid, but then the details, which superfluid does it correspond to any real world material, that is not a priori clear. And that is a problem that this whole community has, of course, to find out where can we apply our uh, nice and beautiful gravity calculations for some dual series. Uh, some people are very uh, optimistic and claim they can solve all kinds of condensed matter problems, uh, uh, which usually those people working on it uh, are not convinced of uh, immediately. But uh, this is a problem, and we try to address this for one particular case here, in, and I'll try to explain this. Now, uh, this brings me uh, to the end of the holography introduction. I hope you got a, an idea of, rough idea of what, uh, what this is about. And if you still trust me that we are doing something reasonable, <laughs> Uh, then uh, let's see what we can do in a particular case of the holographic superfluid in two dimensions. 
Um, and uh, here's the team. Uh, so as I said, Paul Wittmer, uh, my former student, uh, uh, Thomas Gazenza, and his former uh, PhD student, uh, Christian Schmid. Um, uh, my former PhD student, Andrea Samberg, and Thomas' former PhD student, Markus Karl, are also involved in, in different uh, aspects of the results I will show here. Um, so here are the main three main references uh, um, um, that uh, these results are from. And uh, so let's see. Um, in several papers, uh, it was discovered by Steve Gapser was the first to realize that this is possible and then it was extended to a full holographic superfluid uh, uh, shortly afterwards. I leave the dimension general for the moment, but we'll then uh, address two dimensions. So you can describe a superfluid via this duality by taking in ADS, Rotsfield, uh, space-time, as we discussed it, put a gauge field in the bulk and a complex scalar in the bulk. I told you before we could put some fields in. This is what we do. And here is the action. We have again the same action for the anti zitter space, uh, Ritchie scalar, cosmological constant. But then we add this, these two fields, a gauge field and a scalar. And here is well, uh, the gauge field, a coupling to the scalar and uh, the scalar. No potential even for the scalar. That's the simplest case. You can make this more complicated and more interesting. Maybe that's the simplest case that leads to a superfluid in the dual description. And then you have, uh, as I mentioned, you have the superfluid density as the square of the expectation value of an order parameter. And the order parameter, as I mentioned before, is contained in the boundary value. You do a near boundary expansion here uh, of this field in the bulk at z equal zero. First term we set to zero by choosing boundary conditions and the leading term then gives you the expectation value and the order parameter field of the superfluid. Now I cannot go into details why that is actually has all the right symmetries. Um, that would be a talk by itself, but uh, let me just uh, show you what the dictionary is for this case. So we have on the boundary, uh, uh, the holographic superfluid. And in the bulk, one dimension more, we have fields. And the, the dictionary here relates the thermal background at a temperature and chemical potential to the charged black hole, as we discussed. The complex scalar field operator, that we call here, psi, uh, psi here, corresponds to the complex scalar field in the bulk. Well, then we take the expectation value and that is the uh, first term in this near boundary expansion. Um, we have conserved currents, U1 current, that corresponds to the U1 gauge field, and there are precise prescriptions how operators correspond to these fields and so on. We have equations of motions for this action, and uh, of course we have uh, something for the, um, as you see here, uh, for the gravity part. We have uh, Maxwell and uh, uh, find Norton equations for the scalar field and uh, for the gauge field. So uh, we can uh, start our calculation on the gravity side. Um, and one thing that I think is really useful in, in this description of a, of a superfluid is that this holographic description really captures the dynamics via these equations on all relevant length scales. We are not patching anything like for vortex cores, we have a different model which we patch with some other together. All relevant length scales are automatically contained in these equations. And you will see uh, uh, pictures where this really happens. You can relate, at least roughly, uh, not strictly proven for the case I'm showing here, but uh, it gives you a good idea if you think of this black hole as a normal component of the superfluid in the tissa lando model and the gauge field in the bulk describing the superfluid component. And you saw the gauge, uh, this is scalar gives you the uh, order parameter. So um, that's not exact, but to a good approximation, that gives you an idea of what, what is going on. So the black hole is basically the thermal, uh, provides a thermal component and, and the heat bath. 
Now, um, we want to do some, some calculation, uh, and uh, as is often the case, you have to do some approximations then. So what we do is to use the probe approximation. We solve the gauge matter sector on a fixed background. So we first solve the uh, gravity equations of motion, leaving aside uh, the, the uh, gauge matter fields. And um, then we put the gauge fields on this antitositor space. That is a good approximation in, in, in the temperature range we are addressing. Um, however, in principle, you would like to uh, um, include the back reaction of the gauge field or gauge matter part onto the gravity action. Of course, it's coupled equations in principle. And only then you would get the full temperature dependence um, of, of the whole system. But um, uh, in the first step, uh, we did this in the so-called probe approximation. The chemical potential, the charge of the black hole, is implemented via boundary conditions uh, on the technical side here. Uh, so the boundary condition on the gauge field in the bulk uh, gives you a chemical potential. Comes out of this dictionary uh, as well. And uh, the heat bars has a temperature, and that is given, as, as we discussed, uh, with a factor depending on the dimension by the inverse of this position of the uh, uh, black hole in, in the bulk. OK. And then we can calculate an equilibrium uh, uh, configuration of this super fluid. We need to implement all kinds of boundary conditions on it uh, when, we, when we do the numerics. Um, but uh, you can uh, hope you trust me that we do this correctly. And uh, here's the outcome. Um, you see that beyond a bit below, oh, this, uh, I'm sorry, this is T over TC here, this is cut off. Um, so below a temp critical temperature, there is a condensate uh, actually emerging. So there is symmetry breaking happening. You have a condensate. And uh, in this particular model, actually, the temperature and the chemical potential are in one to one relation. So, uh, uh, they are connected in this simple model. You could, in principle, introduce different uh, dependencies, but uh, in the simple model uh, that we use here, they are one-to-one -one related. So uh, one is the inverse of the other. Um, and you see there is a critical temperature below which you have uh, a condensate uh, arising. And what happens in the bulk uh, is actually that you have a, the scalar, and that gets some charge density, which is given by, by a current uh, of, the, uh, of the gauge field. Um, and you have a charge density in the bulk, and that has a profile dependent on the depth in the holographic direction. Uh, and this leads to symmetry breaking. It turns out this, uh, sometimes people call this a black hole evolves hair or something, uh, some buzzwords. But uh, this is actually what happens here. You have a charge density that builds up in the bulk. And you will see that this charge density screens the boundary from the black hole. Um, and uh, now uh, we want to describe non-equilibrium dynamics. So what I showed you here before is uh, equilibrium configuration. And now we want to go beyond that. We use that as a background and put in for our numerical study in the initial condition vortices more or less, sometimes two anti-vortices or many, and do a numerical calculation uh, of the system, of the gravity system, and extract uh, the dual uh, uh, information of the dual uh, 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 superfluid. Now, we do this uh, in two dimensions um, with uh, a large grid here, five, 504 times 504 in these two dimensions of the superfluid. Plus, of course, we need uh, the holographic coordinate. And there we use um, Chebyshev polynomials uh, with uh, 32 collocation points. We have tried uh, that uh, this uh, is, is a good relation and gives uh, sufficient uh, accuracy. It is a huge uh, numerical effort there. We have one dimension more than you usually have in simulations. Uh, so obviously, um, this is not a trivial thing. But we have good students, uh, uh, so uh, they manage. Um, here is the first thing I want to show you. We have um, uh, simulated uh, the system with uh, 
many vortex anti-vortices, vortices, anti-vortices uh, randomly distributed here in this case. Here's the phase information um, and here's the spectrum, uh, radial momentum spectrum that you observe. Now uh, you see that uh, annihilations are uh, going on here. You see that here uh, where you have all these uh, waves uh, emerging annihilations going into sound waves and eventually dissipating uh, in the system. Um, and well, it evolves slowly and it turns out uh, there are several regimes here. Well, I don't want to show you the whole thing to the end. You basically see what's happening. They are getting less and less. And here are the main results. We find that first we have a Kolmogorov regime that you already saw right now in, in the spectrum at intermediate times. but And that was discovered uh, before by Adams, Chesler, and Liu. However, that is only transient. At later times, we find different universal behavior with uh, a spectrum of uh, uh, k to the uh, four point, uh, minus 4.1. And that is something new. Uh, uh, we observed that uh, eventually this evolves into a non-thermal fixed point. And the system stays uh, close uh, to this fixed point for a long time until it eventually reaches uh, thermal equilibrium. And it's the first observation of a non-thermal fixed point in a strongly coupled system at all. So this uh, was quite interesting to observe this turbulent behavior. But uh, uh, what I want to tell you in more detail today uh, is uh, uh, what happens to a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair. A very simple sit uh, situation of just two vortices, one vortex, one anti-vortex, implemented on this huge grid. And what you see here is they build up numerically and then they approach each other. And you see they move towards each other, which is a sign that this usual Helmholtz pair propagation that you will see where they propagate uh, along each other, well, perpendicular to their, to their connection line uh, for a long time is suppressed. And that is already a sign of strong dissipation. And um, uh, so uh, let me go, go back once more and show you this. And we will look at this process in real detail. Now. And uh, all the information we extract comes from this simple process. Um, and you see the annihilation taking place and then eventually it goes into sound waves and uh, is uh, dissipated. Now, why is this interesting? Um, first of all, it turns out, uh, also discovered by Adams, Chesler, Louis, Liu first, that the sites of uh, uh, momentum dis or energy dissipation are mostly the, the, centers, uh, the centers of these vortices. So there is hydrodynamic dissipation in the system everywhere in the fluid, but there is additional, uh, an additional mechanism of momentum modes falling through uh, these uh, uh, kind of holes here, then you see here that the, um, the vortices correspond to, well, these are ether lines of the complex uh, field here in the bulk. And this is uh, the uh, uh, charge density I showed you. So this is a cut through uh, some value 10 or something here. Um, and then you see that these vortices punch holes through this charge cloud in the bulk. And so we have a geometric interpretation of this energy dissipation as fall, modes falling through these, uh, these holes in the, in the charge cloud. That's a very nice uh, intuitive picture that you get from this holographic uh, uh, description. And uh, that because these holes are rather small at the vortex course, it's mainly UV modes that are dissipated. So what we do then is to track these vortices very precisely. So you can do, of course, just a plaquette look, uh, localization of these vertices by looking at plaquettes and uh, uh, counting a, 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 a vortex number uh, going around the plaquette, a winding number, and uh, count the vertices this way. What we do here is implement an additional fitting procedure. We fit Gaussians. It's not exactly Gaussians, but that doesn't matter. Uh, as long as you get the flanks I mean, the blue, blue points are the, really the grid values of our numerical simulation. And then we do a fit of a Gaussian. 
any function will do basically as long as you have the steep flanks uh, described well. And that allows us to, by this Gaussian fitting uh, procedure, we can uh, locate the vortices to about 30 to 50, depending on their velocity, 30 to 50 times more precisely uh, than would be just by counting plaquettes. Um, there's another method, uh, uh, and Davide was, was involved in that. Uh, it's described in this very nice paper down here. Um, Newton Raphson method for locating uh, the, the, the minima of, of, the, uh, of the order parameter field. Um, turns out that this Gaussian fitting is numerically much more efficient. However, it works only when the vortices are really uh, circular or elliptical. Later on in the evolution, close to annihilation, they deform. And then we switch to this newton raphson method to, uh, to locate them also in, in, in that case. And uh, you see that here when uh, after some time uh, that become kind of peanut shaped pair of vortices rather than uh, uh, separate vortices and they are no longer Gaussian in, in, or circular in shape. So uh, then we switch to the other method. And here's what we get as trajectories. Now, first of all, you see, we start with different, uh, these are five different uh, trajectories starting from different initial distances. Um, and what you see is that they are universal, except in the beginning where you see even an, uh, let me show this uh, here, you see an outward bending even of these trajectories very slightly. You wouldn't even see it if you do only plaquette resolution, but with this higher resolution, you see it. And that's because what we put in is a superposition of two separate vortices. However, that is not an exact solution to the full system of correlated phases of the whole plane with, with two vortices. And the system adjusts, builds up the vortex course very quickly, but it takes quite a while, and you see here how long uh, actually it takes until this phase field in the whole non-local uh, uh, phase field is is adjusted. And but after and it's just an effect of our initial conditions. We cannot, we don't know numerically, analytically, uh, the right starting condition. Um, it builds up. It takes a while, but then uh, the dynamics depends only on the distance, um, and. With this uh, tracking method, we can even calculate velocities and accelerations even directly, not just by fitting curves, but directly. Now, what are we doing to quantify the dissipation? I told you we want to quantify the parameters of that system. And the idea is to do with the same initial conditions, same system, uh, numerical uh, analysis in dissipative gross Pitevsky equations. Those you see here, that's an uh, equation for the order parameter field, um, has uh, uh, here a, a gamma uh, parameter, which corresponds to the dissipation. Uh, and well, you can rewrite it in a way that we use. Um, and you have the chemical potential over here. So uh, this, I assume uh, most of you know well. Um, and we do the same initial condition in both systems. And then we tune the and only the parameters of the DGP so that the trajectories, the full vortex motion is matched to the holographic system. Um, for the system of, of vortices, we have three parameters in the DGP describing the system. One is the healing length, basically the vortex size. The other is time rescaling parameter. And as I said, this gamma is a dissipation. It's a non-relativistic system, the DGPE. Actually, ours is formed, the holographic is formally relativistic, but things move slowly. Um, so we have a time rescaling parameter in addition. And we tune these, actually, we can tune these parameters independently to match the holographic vortex motion with high precision. First, we do this to fix the healing lengths. And once we fix the healing lengths correctly, then the vortex shape, as you see, are almost not even not only the size, but also the shape is an excellent agreement. So we describe basically the same vortex, uh, vortex shape in both systems. Then we go on and match the trajectories in space that fixes the gamma and in time that fixes the tau. And you see here, 
there's excellent agreement between these, uh, except shortly before the annihilation. And let me make this clear. The difference is only down here between the yellow and the blue curve. Otherwise, they are on top of each other for the whole evolution, including this outward bending, which you also have in DGP. It's exactly the same. The trajectories are really matched. And you see, we do this with high precision that because if you increase uh, this gamma by 10 or 20 percent, you get really different trajectories. You would see this. So it's a high precision determination of this gamma for, for the holographic superflow. And you see, uh, well, except at late times, there are some differences, as I uh, said, and probably UV dynamics is different in the two, two series, but still, and the system is not necessarily dilute, so DGPE is maybe not the op optimal way to describe it. Still, it can be used to determine or give us a good idea of what the dissipation parameter in our holographic system is. We will not be off by a factor 10. So now if we do that, we find that this gamma is 0.3 for the holographic superfluid. Now typical Bose-Einstein condensates with alkali atoms, uh, typical temperatures have orders of magnitude less. So this tells us clearly that the holographic superfluid is strongly dissipative, which is nice because then we have a method uh, to describe something which is otherwise very difficult to describe. Still, we would like to know, can we apply it to some real world system? And um, now with uh, these uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, it turns out to be difficult. If you want to increase this gamma by increasing uh, scattering lengths, uh, systems are difficult uh, uh, to, to uh, really treat experimentally and to stabilize, I understand. So probably we are not in a range to describe uh, typical Bose-Einstein condensates called quantum gases. However, let's go step, one step further. We can compare these trajectories also to holbein jordansky equations. These are equations for mechanical motion of point vortices. And they have, here they are. Well, well that's uh, one vortex in the field of the others. Well, there are only two here. They have C and C prime friction coefficients. And we can measure them from our trajectories. And we do that here in this region before there's this outward bending that I described. It's an artifact. Afterwards, we have this annihilation process. But in between, there is a sufficiently large region where we can describe uh, match this to these uh, uh, holbein jordansky equations and find excellent agreement of the trajectories. And we can extract this, this parameter C prime. 0.3 to 0.1, 0.03 to 0.1. And now the uh, experiment tells us if you take uh, superfluid helium films at a, about Kelvin temperatures, that's in this range. And if you take thermally excited Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, there are values in the literature very similar to what we have. So the conclusion is quite interesting that this holographic vortex dynamics might actually be applicable to superfluid helium films and thermal uh, was Einstein condensates. We are not claiming that we can describe this, this, this substance as such, this helium with all the temperature dependence, just the vortex dynamics. But the holographic superfluid has a strongly dissipative vortex dynamics, and it is in a range where, which might be relevant to these experiments. And we expect, of course, that all this works also for more complicated vortex uh, uh, configurations, uh, turbulence even. We did it only just for these two to extract these parameters. Now, um, if you allow me just a teaser, we can do things in three dimensions. Let me just to show very briefly a few pictures. Um, we hope to publish this uh, very soon. Um, equations of motion become more complicated, same principle. Um, we can describe vortex lines, here's the flow field and the density. We can have a holographic picture also of these. And then of course we can cut uh, them, uh, well, in the way before, but also along the lines, of course. And then things become more interesting in the bulk and you get a geometric picture also of dissipation here. We can do vortex rings. Also they can be cut in different ways to get a holographic uh, bulk view of them. So in different directions here, the uh, 
these holes in the uh, charge cloud in the bulk uh, above the black hole are well have more interesting uh, uh, cuts uh, and holes. Um, we can look at the behavior and motion of vortex lines and how they reconnect and dis redistribute energy in this process. And uh, you see, I mean, they form larger structures and eventually that becomes a big, um, a big ring. And then what is interesting that these rings generally contract very quickly. Again, indicating strong dissipation and we are confident we can also there uh, describe a three-dimensional strongly dissipative uh, uh, superfluid. We have still have to uh, exactly uh, pin down the, the, the dissipation parameters. Um, and also we have uh, sound waves in this system and so on. Um, and even we can describe uh, leapfrogging rings, for example, uh, slipping through each other and also there have a transverse view of that, uh, of the density, um, uh, which is very nice. So all this is a gravitational calculation in a higher dimensional space. And we describe dynamics of vortex lines, vortex rings in a superfluid at strong dissipation. I think that's, uh, I, I find it still amazing every time I look at these. Uh, uh, these videos, um, because we start somewhere really uh, with the gravitational system and black holes and uh, get something uh, very interesting like this uh, leapfrogging motion that Helmholtz uh, discovered or suggested uh, 150 years ago. Um, so that's uh, pretty interesting. And the strong dissipation causes these rings to contract very slowly. But small dissipation that will go on forever, but here it's not. So let me summarize here. Uh, so we have done a matching of DGPE and holbein jodansky equation to the vortex dynamics of a holographic superfluid. And we have, by that matching, extracted dissipation parameters. We can say, put numbers on these dissipation parameters of this superfluid described by higher dimension gravity. Um, it's strongly dissipative. And it seems that it's in a range that might be relevant for superfluid helium films and thermal Bose Einstein condensates. And I should point out that's the first direct determination of parameters of any holographic system via a dynamical process. As I said, in many cases, you're just guessing what the parameters are. You know, the, 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 the viscosity is very low, but that's it. And then you have to kind, kind of guess what the material or the substance might be that you describe. And we have, in this case, really been able to, to pin this down with numbers. Uh, as an outlook, of course, we would like to do uh, compare these to experiment our calculation in more detail, uh, implement back reaction to, this, uh, to study temperature dependence, and of course, in, in three-dimensional holographic superfluids as a whole bunch of things that uh, a variety of things that would be very interesting. Also solitons uh, could be studied in this way and so on. So I hope uh, I gave you some kind of interesting, hopefully uh, instructive overview of what we are doing. Thank you for your interest.